embarrassed. Why are you making me tell this? I'm blushing and I don't blush. Last semester I had a driver's license and that's an interesting story. I wrecked the driver's ed car, but it's... Uh, okay, well, the show is called <laughs> The Greatest Stories Never Told and that sounds like a pretty good story. Gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Why are you making me tell this? I'm blushing and I don't blush. They, they had these cars that you drive around the thing with the cones and your driver's side has the, the gas and the brake and the other side has the gas and the brake too. So maybe just the brake. I don't think it has the gas, just the brake. So meanwhile, I was in the car with a boy I had a crush on. They should have never put us as partners and I started to get nervous. <laughs> and I thought I was pressing the brake and I pressed the gas and went straight into, and he was trying to push the brake but it wasn't working for some oh, reason, wow. it was faulty. And I went straight into building 10 and they all ran out like, what is going on? The car was just a disaster. It was a Velari. I don't know if they make Velaris anymore, but the, the sign of the Velari fell off the car. Oh boy. So when I graduated and walked across the stage to get my diploma, the principal handed me my diploma and the Velari thing. <laughs> oh! oh man, was there people in building 10? Were yes, they like the writing and they just all <laughs> there? What is going on? But like, oh, it was a brick building, so I didn't get very far, but. I mean, talk about humiliating. I've, I've become a much better driver since then, the hopefully. Yeah, and now there's Uber and Lyft. Right, so nobody needs to. So pre-texting and driving, you, I, yeah. you still manage to wreck the car over a crush, so that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, I think there's the lesson is don't drive with people you have crushes on maybe because it didn't end up well for me. Imagine being discovered at the age of 21 and being asked to host one of the biggest talk shows in the entire world. That's the true story of my guest today. Her name is Debbie Metanopoulos, and you'll recognize her because since then she's hosted MTV shows. She's hosted Saturday Night Live. She's everywhere and her story is gonna blow your mind. We filmed this in front of a live studio audience at my company because Debbie and I are working on a special project together. You're gonna hear about that today too on The Greatest Stories Never Told. Did, am I allowed to talk about your shoes? Yeah, yeah, you can make fun of me as much as humanly possible. Is, is that on camera? Yes, this is all. You're gonna all have to keep thing. those shoes. Is that the? Yeah, I don't thing? think you can. I think that's a play. If you wear someone else's shoes without socks on, sneakers, I think you probably have to buy the person new shoes and keep the shoes. Well, my brother and I have a history of pranking each other. So one of our favorite things to do is called the crab handshake. Okay, what's that? Have you ever been to Boiling Crab where they serve the crab in bags and it's in Cajun sauce and no, you rip that it up cool. and even after you wash your hands 16 times, they still smell right. like garlic? Yeah. So the crab handshake is going out to a crab restaurant, not washing a hand on purpose and then being like, hey man, how are you doing? And just give them the crab shake. So this is... That's like the crab foot shake? Yeah, yeah, this is the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the uh, lower extremity version okay. of the crab yeah, handshake. Good. So, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. And we'll talk about that in part two. But let's okay. talk about you. Thanks for being here. Thank so excited you. to dive into your story today. Okay. So, you were the youngest talk show host in history. Yeah. Let's go back before that, wow. though. Wow, okay. What were you like as a child? Did you have any type of interviewing experience? Or I'd... did you sneak onto the set? Or what happened? Oh my that gosh, happen? I never stopped talking. And I used to constantly get in trouble for talking at school. This was well before, you know, you weren't allowed to. It was well before everyone won a, a trophy for everything they did. So let's just put, point that out. Because the teachers back then would literally, you know, they wouldn't hit you. But if you did something wrong, you knew you did something wrong. So I, no joke, many times remember having to sit in the corner staring at the wall while the other kids got to go out and play oh, because wow. I wouldn't stop talking. And then it became like a joke later on in my life. And I was like, to all you teachers out there, who punished me for talking, now I get paid to do it. So, there you go. <laughs> no, I just like, yeah. so, you know, I, I was always very inquisitive, much to the dismay of my older sister and brother and my parents. I was that kid that always said, but why, but why, but why? And now I'm being punished with my own daughter who's five and constantly says, but why, but why? And I'm like, I don't know why, I don't have the answers. I'm just trying my best. Was there a dunce hat involved? Because you hear about those stories, yes, but. That's a true story. That, that really yeah, I, I honestly think about it now and I think, if they were to do that to a child in, at a school in our day and age, you'd be sued. And they didn't think twice. They put me in, a, in the corner with the dunce cap. Well, I think maybe if the dunce cap was a gender neutral color, it would be okay. <laughs> like if it was like a taupe or something like that. I mean, it would have been much better had it been like a princess crown or maybe like, a, like an Elsa sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, from Frozen and then it would have been okay. Who knows what you would have been doing now as a career if it would have been that. Yeah, 
Yeah, maybe. I would definitely not be singing. Nobody wants to hear me sing, but I could probably try. Any type of performance, though, in your youth? Um, no. I mean, I did, I did plays and I did gymnastics. Oh, maybe. You know what? I grew up in a very Greek household. I didn't speak English until I was five years old. No kidding. Yeah, I only spoke Greek. And I remember going to kindergarten and then teaching us the ABCs and me being so proud because I was already going to Greek school. And I got up there and I started writing, like, Greek letters and all the kids were making fun, like, oh, she's doing, she's scribbling. And the teachers were like, what in the hell? I think she's a genius. But no. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was a language being transmitted from another universe, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. But I'd already learned the Greek alphabet, but um, I did a, a lot of Greek dance. Like they would put us in Greek folk dance, if anyone is familiar with that. So I have some funny costumes as a kid. Is anyone familiar with Greek folk dance? Because I'm not. I knew you would be, that's why I looked <laughs> So if you've been to a Greek wedding, all those dances that they do at Greek weddings, that's Greek folk dance. And they do a lot of, they do something called the tsiftateli, which is, it's like Greek belly dancing. So like every seven-year-old knows how to belly dance. Oh, wow. <laughs> not, is that and, still and, allowed? Yeah, but it's okay. not in a way that is at all, you know, objectifying. Is it's, it gender neutral? It's gender neutral. <laughs> Whoever wants to belly dance can belly dance. Okay. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Kind of like Shakira at the Super Bowl. Nice. And then... Take us to, you're 21 years old, and you started as an intern, am I right? I started as an intern at MTV when I was 17, and that goes back to, um, so I graduated high school pretty young. I was 16 years old. I was the youngest person in my class. I started school when I was four, kindergarten, wow. and that was before you had to, like back then they'd put you in school as long as you took a test. Now if, and I know this only because my daughter, you know, getting into school, if you turn you have to turn five before September or something like that, but that didn't used oh, to right. be a thing. Okay. So, and I'm, you know, sure, I was, the, I'm the third child. So my brother is 11 years older than me and my sister's eight years older than me. I was an oops. So I came along. Yeah, oh, they're gosh. like, oh, wow, okay, we have another kid. And that means you didn't have a driver's license all through high school. No, I didn't. All my friends drove me to school, but until the end and then I, I last semester I had a driver's license and that's an interesting story I wrecked the driver's ed car but it's uh, okay well the show is called <laughs> the greatest stories never told and that sounds like a pretty good story so, okay we'll get to MTV in a minute yeah 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 we gosh I'm so embarrassed why are you making me tell this I'm blushing and I don't blush so I obviously was very young and was like the last person in my class to take driver's ed and I'm in there with the people like in 11th grade do they even teach driver's ed at school anymore do we know or do you have to go to the DMV to do it? Well, back then, they would drive, they would teach you. So I, um, they, they had these cars that you drive around the thing with the cones, and on the other, your driver's side has the, the gas and the brake, and the other side has the gas and the brake, too. You know this, okay. So maybe just the brake. I don't think it has the gas, just the brake. So meanwhile, I was in the car with a boy I had a crush on. They should have never put us as partners, and I started to get nervous. <laughs> And I thought I was pressing the brake, and I pressed the gas and went straight into, and he was trying to push the brake, but it wasn't working for some reason. Wow. It was faulty. And I went straight into Building 10, and they all ran out like, what is going on? The car was just a disaster. It was a Velari. I don't know if they make Velaris anymore, but the, the sign of the Velari fell off the car. Oh boy. So when I graduated and walked across the stage to get my diploma, the principal handed me my diploma and the Velari thing. <laughs> oh. oh man, was there people in Building 10? Were yes, they like the writing and they just <laughs> all What is going on? But like, oh, it was a brick building, so I didn't get very far. But I mean, talk about humiliating. I've, I've become a much better driver since then, Good hopefully. Year. Yeah, and now there's Uber and Lyft. <laughs> right, so nobody needs to. So pre texting and driving, you, and, you yeah. still managed to wreck the car over a crush. So that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, I think there's the lesson is don't drive with people you have crushes on, maybe because. Didn't end up well for me. Wow. So, so glad you survived. City, okay. And then I didn't have to drive in New York You City. moved to New York City right after high school? No, well, I, because I was so young, my very strict Greek parents would not let me leave Virginia, where I grew up, and they insisted that I stay there. And I always sort of had my sights on New York City. I just wanted, for some reason, I just loved New York. And this was when MTV was really cool, and MTV still played videos, and it was... It was like the one place we all turned on to like see pop culture and see what's going on. And well before anything here would tell us everything, you know, like no social media. 
This is when you were getting your news from Polly Shore. He was a pretty much, yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty much a tab of the sword and Kurt Loader. That was for sure. Yeah. MTV News. That's where yeah. I went to work. But um, I, I was very young, and I probably shouldn't have been watching this. I was with my brother and my sister, and I remember watching Madonna sing like a virgin and roll across the stage at the MTV Video Music Awards, and I thought, I don't know what that is, but I want to go whatever they're doing. That's where I want to be. And I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I want to be around those people. This is just fascinating to me. What is happening? You know, and I must have been like eight or nine and been like, what? So um, I, I graduated high school and I went to uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU in Richmond, because they wouldn't let me leave. And then I, I decided that I would like try to work the radio station. So I started working the radio station and I had like an overnight shift just doing kind of like DJ rave music. And on I was the on the air and yeah. I was digging it and I knew all these rave DJs and I would bring them all in. It was so much fun. It was some raves were really hot. And then um, the program director, for some reason, just up and quit. He's like, I'm out of here. I don't know why. And there, here I am, a freshman at VCU. They're like, I mean, you seem to be really into this. You spend so much time. You want to be the program director? You know, I mean, it's a like college and they're, I was like, oh, okay. So then I started programming the channel. And at that time, I figured, well, you know, I kind of have some experience. Let me see if I can, how I'm going to get myself to MTV. Let me see if I can apply for an internship. Now, I'm a freshman in college. Are you even 18 years old yet? No, I'm 17. Wow. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? And how am I going to convince my parents that I need to move to New York? So I thought, well, if I have a job in the business and I'm, you know, studying broadcast journalism and I get credit, I'm getting credit for college, so it's essentially a college course. So that was kind of my way of thinking. Now, mind you, you don't do an internship your freshman year usually. You do an internship your junior or senior year. But because my parents were Greek immigrants, they didn't know this. <laughs> this was my way to sort of figure it out. So um, I, I, I had, um, do you, does anyone remember the Mighty Mighty Deftones? You do. They came in to the radio station and their manager came in with them and I was interviewing them. So I was interviewing all these pretty cool bands. I mean, they were kind of like underground bands like, uh, God, Tad, Tad, do you remember a guy named Tad? Anyway, it was, and Gwar, you remember Gwar? Yeah, They yeah. came through there. I mean, yeah, it was, and are a big band. there you go. Oh my gosh, exactly. So they, um, they came through with their manager and I said to the manager, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking about moving to New York City and do you know anybody who's leasing or subleasing? He goes, I can't believe you're asking me this. Yes, I'm subleasing. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, I need to get out of town. I'm going to go on tour. Could you take my place for a year? I'm like, this is, like, it's all, like, all the stars aligned perfectly. Now the only thing is, I still need to figure out how I was going to get there. I got a place to live, but how am I going to get there? Not just a place to live, a place to live that was the place of the manager of Guar. Which, uh, Mighty Mighty Deftones. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. but it Still was, cool. yeah, and it was on Bleecker and Mercer. Like, I could not have asked for a better location. Right in the mix. Right in the mix. Yeah. So, I said, okay, let me see how, how this is gonna work. So, I, I said, I'll get back to you, just, you know, so every one, like, every once a month he would text me, is this happening, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I can rent something month to month for people to let me know. So, I, um, I applied for internships at Larry King when he was still in New York and uh, MTV. There was one, oh, Letterman for Letterman. And the only reason I did Larry King was because I knew my parents would be like, oh, sure, Larry King, you got to work Larry King, beautiful. <laughs> Very smart, Larry King. So I, but I really wanted to be at MTV. I didn't even think about it for like another, you know, six, seven weeks. And I get a phone call randomly. I know, I know one, zero of the people at MTV, and I get a phone call from Human Resources saying, hey, this is um, Sarah Sirluca, would you like to come in for an interview? We're hiring the interns for next semester. I'm like, what? And I'm thinking, someone's punking me, this is not true, like this is one of my friends. I'm like, sure, you know, when could you see? She was like, could you be up here in the next week? I drop everything, I go up there, I, I take the train from, from Richmond to, to the city, I go in for the interview and I literally turned around and, and got back on the train and went back. So it was like a seven hour ride up, which was very fun and cool. I mean, you were 17 years old. I mean, it's, yeah, it's very exciting. City, yeah. yeah, so I go in and I have the interview. She's like, great, um, can you start as soon as um, 
the semester is over, which would have been summer. So I'm like, absolutely. So I start, I think like at the end of May before most of the interns, and the internship was gonna last, I, not through the full summer because they would have a second set of interns for the second part of the summer. So I guess I would have been over probably at the beginning of July and they would have brought the other ones in and I was gonna be getting credit, like two credits or something, which was fine. So I convinced my parents I had to go do this over the summer. Don't worry, I'm gonna be back for the year, which was never in my brain. I was not coming back. Did they know what MTV was? Oh yeah, they knew what MTV was. And I was like, mom, Larry King didn't call. And if I don't do this internship, I'll never get a job. So I have to go. I mean, it's the law. If I don't do an internship, they don't hire you for TV. So then what? And she's like, oh, okay, go. I thought, I don't know, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it ended up being all right. I mean, she now knows. They both know. They're like, you were such a devil. Like, it could have turned out so much worse. But, you know, I always had the mindset of, like, I, I was never going to get myself into too much trouble. I had a goal. I had set my mind on something, and I was going to do it. And, yes, I was a kid, and I, you know, still wanted to have fun and go out in New York City, blah, blah, blah. But I was never going to do something that could potentially take me away from what I'd set my mind on. Like, I, it was very laser focused. This was it. And that's why I went there. And you were looking for a hosting career at that point? I or know. interviewing? Or just I something in know. front of the camera, though? No, no not necessarily. Not just I just was very inquisitive. And I just loved to ask people questions. I mean, I was okay. just always very naturally curious about everything in life. And just at that moment, it happened to be MTV because it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. So I, um, I get up there, whatever, I do this internship, and I basically do every single thing that any of the producers asked me. Like, I was not that intern that walked in, and they were like, so what do you want to do? And I was like, oh, I'm going to have your job. I wasn't that person. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Everybody knows that person that comes in. You're like, so what would you like to do? And they're like, well, someday I'd like to be sitting where you are. And you're like, okay, this interview's going very well. I just met you. <laughs> so, so I did pretty much... Like, I came out on Saturdays, and this is before they had to pay for internships, so it was free, completely free. I would come in on weekends and do whatever the producers need me to do. I was logging tapes. I was carrying um, D, gosh, D2 tapes. Does anyone remember those? These big, thick tapes and these beta tapes. You remember back and forth from, like, the studio to the control, which was down on 42nd Street, and it was New York was seedy at that time, like seedy. You were walking past them, really. It was before Giuliani got in there and turned it into Disneyland. It was, it was pretty. I mean, there were a lot of, there were a lot of like 25 cent pop in kind of places. There were like, oh, peekaboo kind of rooms, and those are the ones that you had to walk past. And here I'm, this like 17 year old. And were you seeing the stars on? The set, or were they well, all I kind was, of removed and you were in the office? No, because I was at MTV News. Oh, MTV News. So, yeah, so that's where my internship was. So I remember, like, the first time they asked me to go out on a shoot, and it was with the Beastie Boys, and I thought I had legitimately won the lottery. And I, I didn't care that I wasn't being paid. It did not matter to me because what I was gaining in life experience was so much more valuable than any paycheck they could have ever given me. Still to this day, like I still really approach life that way, where I'm like, who cares? Because at the end of the day, we're all going to the same place. We're all headed to that same box. And no one's getting out of here alive. So what's gonna matter, how much money you have or how much, how much richness you have out of your life? And to me, that's what really matters. Like, yeah. so being there with the Beastie Boys and then being like, hey, you want concert tickets? I'm like, oh my God, and we call them back in Virginia, I'm like, I I'm living the dream. Yes, I'm eating ramen noodles for the last two months, but I don't care because it was so fun. So but it's a great lesson too. When you're young yeah. and you can do that, go for the experience that's going to give you the most richness in your mind yeah. instead of your bank account. Exactly. And at the end of the day, the people that you're working for see the drive and they see the excitement and they see that interest and like the kind of like the zest that you have for this particular thing. And they like that. You know, people want to work with people that are curious and are interested in what they're doing, not people that are complacent and tired and bored and like, oh, what am I doing here, whatever. You know, there were a lot of the interns that were like that with me. They just mm -hmm. didn't care. They were there for their two credits and they were hoping they were going to get lucky and someone was going to give them a job. And then when it came to time for me to go back to BCU, um, I had to, you have to get your like review from your superior. So I went into the head of the news department, Dave Cyrulnik, 
who I'm mean, looking back now, Dave was probably 40 years old, but remember I'm 17 and in my brain, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's a God, I'm a child. And I'm so nervous around him. <laughs> you know, like, Mr. Cyrillnik. And he was so cool. And he, um, he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know, but I, I think I really want to work here. I love it here and I love everybody. And you guys have been so wonderful to me and kind of taking me under your wings and so willing to help me learn so many things. I mean, I learned how to use cameras. I learned everything. I learned how to like story coordinate, how to write a story, how to, how to write a segment, how to pitch something, you know? So, I mean, I think that was probably a big part of why I'm still here. Yeah. Because I think I learned everything along the way, and I just didn't walk in and say, give me questions, I'm going to ask them to somebody. Yeah, like, so I, I get what everybody, everybody's job is so essential in order for me to actually do my job. And then later, you, because you know a little bit about each thing, you can tell us someone's doing a good it, job. Isn't that interesting? And I'm always like, oh, okay. But, but then again, everybody has a learning curve. So you also have to be very patient and very cognizant of that. And a lot of times I'll look back at, you know, some of the people who work now, and I'm like, oh, my God, that was me. That was me, my, my head was so far up my tush, I had no idea what I was doing, let me help you, come here. <laughs> let me help you out a little bit. But, so Dave said, do you wanna stay here? And I said, yes, I'd love to, but you know, I, I, yeah, my dream is to stay in New York City and work here a thousand percent. But my parents are immigrants from Greece and they never had the opportunity to go to college. And for me to say to them, I'm gonna quit school and come work at MTV is not a possibility. It's just not an option. Like they came to this country with nothing, with three children and worked their asses off to get that, to like put us through school and to make sure that we were, you know, doing the best we can and they did the best they could for us. I can't, I just can't. And he said, well, what if you went to NYU? And I said, I don't even know if I can get into NYU. And I don't know if my, tra my credits would transfer. He's like, I went to NYU let me make a call and I said what like again this guy had no reason to help me except for the fact that he saw some young kid who was super hungry never said no came in with a smile on her face like half the time had to walk home from 45th and Broadway to Bleecker and Mercer because I didn't have money for the subway wow. like legit in, and I was I never complained and was the first to come and the last to leave so he's like Dean Cal, Dave Cyrulnik you know I got the student see if you can transfer he's like great send your transcripts so I called the school, again, unbeknownst to my parents that I'm even doing this. <laughs> so I said, everything gets transferred over. He's like, well, call us in a few days and let us know. He's like, uh, Debbie, come in here. So Dean Kalb said that, um, yeah, you can transfer. You're going to lose quite a bit of credit. You're going to lose 12 credits, which is a semester. So I'm going to have to go to school around the clock and, and summer school and the whole thing just to graduate. He's like, would you stay on? And I go, yeah, I need to talk to my parents about it. But yes, I would stay on. And he goes, okay, great. We'll hire you. You ready? For $75 a day, living in New York City. <laughs> I was, it's, like a sandwich at it's a sandwich and a Starbucks. And the subway, at least. That's right. So I, I transfer. I tell my parents, you know, listen, I'm, I would never do this. I'm obviously going to finish school. Or I know, like, my dad was very much like, you don't finish school, don't come home. It was like that. We you know, we never had that opportunity. You have every opportunity in the world. You are in the United States of America. Do not throw your opportunities away where other people in other countries don't have that option. So I was very cognizant of that. And I, so I transferred to NYU. I, um, and I started going to school from the first class, 745 until 10. And then I'd take the subway to MTV and work from like 1030 until six and then go to night school. And I did that for, four years almost amazing. because I ended up losing all those credits and I would do it again it was the most amazing experience and Dave would always check in on me be like you okay and I was like yeah yeah I'm fine he's like look as long as you get your work done I don't care when you do it just get it done by the deadline this piece needs to be done in a week it doesn't matter to me when you do it just do it nice. you know and he would also like add, it was interesting because he was the type of guy who wasn't just concerned with my my job at work he would ask me like or how are your grades you know he like it, You'll come across certain people, as I'm, I bet you're this guy, you'll come across people in your life that are so instrumental in sort of who you become, and he was one of them. And for no other reason, he had no reason to be nice to me, except that he saw that I wanted to do this and he saw that I was going to work hard. So amazing. 
Yeah. And I bet now you do that for other people. I do, always, yeah. always, always. I think, yeah. you know, because if it wasn't for him just taking a chance on me, who knows? Maybe I'd be back in Virginia with, like, bubble hair doing the 5 o'clock news. <laughs> so great. So did you end up in front of the camera at one point on MTV, or yeah. was that, okay, how'd that happen? Okay, so at MTV, again, they're very um, frugal, let's say. Okay, they're probably paying people more than $75 now, but they were very frugal at the time. So they um, would just basically take anyone, like a PA, an intern, we need you. Come on, get up here, we need to shoot you. And again, it was like at the beginning, at the inception of all this really cool stuff, and like they were kind of creating this new genre that didn't exist before. So House of Style was just launching with Cindy Crawford, and oh, maybe Cindy was leaving at that time. I think Shalom. Do you guys remember Shalom and Amber Valletta? Yeah, yeah. So those two, I think, were doing it, and they needed someone. I was a PA on that shoot, and they said, we need to dye someone's hair pink with Kool-Aid to show how the punk rockers did their hair before there was writ dye and all the, like, manic panic and all that stuff. So they're like, Debbie, your hair's blonde. It's very porous. Come on. I'm like, what? And they're like, we're dyeing your hair bright pink. It was about as bright pink as, as this. Oh, yeah. And it was in the middle of a snowstorm in New York City. So I was walking around with bright pink hair, like juxtaposed to the white snow. It was bananas. I looked crazy. But so I said, yeah, sure, you can do my hair. It didn't come out for weeks. So that was the first time I ended up on, on the channel. And then they would put us on different things because we owned Nickelodeon. It was Viacom. Okay. So they'll put me on like Nickelodeon stuff here and there. Get slime. I never got slimed. I always wanted to get slimed, though. That would have been fun. Well, we have a special surprise for you today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that same week that they had dyed my hair pink, it was Todd Oldham actually did it. Do you remember the designer, Todd Oldham? Remember him? He was so cool. So that week, I'm at a party at, um, again, strange, like this type of people that you hang around when you're, kind of in that group at MTV, um, Calvin Klein was having a party at his house for a friend of mine who was moving to Idaho because he wanted to be um, an anchor and he was never going to get a job in front of the camera in New York City. He was going to have to start in a small market, you know, kind of work his way up. So Calvin having to know him, he's giving him this party uptown at this big fancy pants house. Remember, I'm still making $75 a day and eating ramen soup. So I walk in there, I'm like, what is going on in here? I mean, this is crazy town. So I show up there with my roommate and there was a casting director there for a show called The View From Here or A Room With A View. They didn't really know what the name was, but it was for Barwall Productions, for Barbara Walters production company and I walk in with hot pink hair and I'm probably like wearing some baby tee or something because that was kind of the thing and like some low slung pants and thinking I'm real MTV <laughs> and he said hey would you like to come in audition for a show for Barbara Walters and I was I said are you talking to me for Barbara Walters I have pink hair I'm wearing a half shirt. What does Purple Walters want to do with me? I said, I work at MTV. I don't think like I'm I don't think I'm the right like fit. Thank you. But I don't think I'm the right fit. He goes, oh no, no, no. They're starting a new show with different women, different generations, different backgrounds, different views. And you would be perfect for the young kid. And I said, All right. I didn't think anything else of it. Completely ignored it, whatever. And wait, did you have a conversation with the person? Yeah, okay, okay. It was very so, cool. Right, we just yeah. continued to hang out. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy's nice. He's a cool guy, whatever. We had a couple cocktails. So then I kind of mingled and talked to everybody else at the party, the people I knew, because my friend was leaving the next day. So I was like, yeah, this guy's nice, but you know, it's not about me. It's about my friend. So he, that um, casting director, ended up talking to my roommate at the time, who also worked at MTV and was Kurt Loder's assistant. And he was, I don't know, they were going to collaborate on something, and they were talking business and shop. And I was floating around, just having fun. So we say our goodbyes, we leave. The next morning, I have to be at school again, crack of dawn, because I'm going to MT, I'm working at, um, I mean, I'm going to NYU still. So I run out of the house, because we were out late. I mean, I hadn't even showered that morning. I like, was running out, brushing my teeth, get to school, get on the subway, go to MTV, and I'm there for about 30 minutes, and my roommate gets a phone call in her cubicle, two down, and she's like, um, they're calling you from ABC. They want you to go over there. Again, I'm like, what? That, I just talked to that guy. What are you talking about? She's like, it's, they need to meet as many people as they can because they're trying to cast this thing. Can you go over there right now? 
I'm like, Julie, I didn't even take a shower. I look crazy. I have pink hair. <laughs> and that day, I do remember exactly what I was wearing. A mini skirt, again, MTV dress code, boots to my knees, and a little baby t-shirt. Again, it must have been my signature style, half shirt, with John Travolta's face on it, and it said Barbarino. Boom. <laughs> From Welcome Back, Cotter. And I'm thinking, this is how I'm going to meet Barbara Walters. Oh, let's not forget my bowling bag purse. <laughs> I, thought, I can't believe this cannot be happening. And I'm looking around the newsroom like, does anyone have any clothes that I can put on? I can't go over to ABC like this. This is crazy. And so someone had like a very, um, <laughs> like, you know, presentable sort of like black blazer thing that I tried to put over it, but it was not saving the outfit at all. So I get there. I sit down with um, Bill Getty, who was the executive producer. He's, right now, he's the executive producer of Tamron Hall. Like, he's a pretty big deal. He was, became my mentor, and thank God for him. He taught me so much along the way. But for the first, like, 20 minutes, and, bar, and, and Bill's asking me, so what do you know about pop culture? And what do you know? I was like, well, I have pink hair, and I'm carrying a bowling bag. Like, what do I, all I know is pop culture. Like, I don't, you can ask me anything else. I have no idea, but I'm so immersed in MTV. Like, so what do you, you know, what do you think of, oh, Howard Stern private parts had just come out. What do you think of the movie Private Parts? I was like, you know, it was a big hit. I think it's, you know, what Howard Stern has marketed. If you like him or not, he's a genius and blah, blah, blah. So then Barbara comes in the last 10 minutes. She's like, oh, hello, I'm Barbara. Oh, I love your hair. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. This is awful. And truthfully, I said to the newsroom when I left that day, and they were all like, go get him, Debbie. I'm like, I, go get what? I'm like, I, this is crazy. I'm a PA at MTV. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to them, I go, look, I will, I will have a cocktail story for the rest of my life that I met the, you know, the most well-renowned journalist in the world, female journalist in the world. So for the rest of my life now, I'll be able to tell everyone, oh my gosh, I met Barbara Walters and this is how it went down and she's so cool. That's all I thought I was going to get out of this. And perhaps maybe the lesson there is maybe that's why I got the job because I went in there not stressed out. I didn't go in there with any expectations. As a matter of fact, my expectations were so low. I just thought this would be a cool experience. Again, for the experience, yeah, not the paycheck. Yeah. It was still, again, just the experience. And I never imagined, I mean, in a million years imagined they'd actually say come back for the interview, I mean, the audition. So she says, oh, we'd love to have you back for the audition. And I'm like, what? OK, so two weeks from then, they say come back for this audition. And it was at the um, plaza. I think it was the plaza in New York City, and they had sort of rented half of one of the top floors. So the executives went in there, and they wired all the rooms so they could be in another room, and they had all the monitors set up, and the cameras were in the other room. None of us knew that. We just thought they were filming it for later. I mean, they were all watching the whole time. So um, the day of that I'm going over there, I, and you know, being so green and completely oblivious, I'm like, well, I still have to go to work. So I go to MTV. <laughs> this is like the interview of a lifetime for people. So I'm still at the news, and I go into the news department, whatever, and they're kind of prepping me. And so I'm like, okay, so you know, I'll go over there and see what happens, and then I'll see you guys like after I'm done. So I go uptown, a little further uptown because MTV is pretty uptown too. But um, I walk into this room, and I realize I'm with such seasoned people like legit people. Um, Joan Rivers was in there. I don't know if you guys remember a woman named Mother Love. Uh, she was super cool. Emmy was like a supermodel. Veronica Webb was in there. Just people that I should, Sissy Biggers. Like a lot of people in the journalism world that I knew of. And the room was about this big. And are they auditioning for the same all, part all as you? No, not for me because they were older. But Veronica Webb was, Emmy, Tyra Banks, like okay. people that were kind of in my age range. Wow. And I'm like, this is, what am I doing here? Like, I work at MTV. Like, who am I kidding? This is, I gotta leave. I've gotta leave. So now the experience became turned into panic in my heart because now I was like, oh boy. Okay, I'm in the big leagues and now I have to deliver. Like, this is not just me being charming and laughing. Now I'm gonna have to sit here with these people who have degrees in journalism and have been doing this for years. And oh my God. I mean, I had a degree in journalism too, but I was working at MTV, you know what I mean? So, oh, I didn't even get the degree yet. I got the degree when I was at The View. So I turn around to leave. I'd gone through makeup because they had their hair and makeup people and they were, you know, doing my makeup. I'm like, eh. 
to actually leave, to walk out the door. Leave. You were going to leave. I was yeah. done. This was as far as I was going to take this ride, and everybody in TV was on the ride with me, and everybody thought it was so funny, including Dave. Dave Cyrulnik, it was like, you go get that job. I was like, you guys, I don't have the experience. It's people. I've been on MTV like three or four times. You guys sat me up to do like MTV News once. Like, it's not, this is a different ball game. I'm not on the same playing field as these people. So I turn around to leave, and as I'm walking out of the door, I'm, I say, you know, I have to believe that some things in the universe just happen the way they're supposed to happen simply because there's too many coincidences in my life to have gotten me where I am today. You have to s surrender yourself and say, there's a bigger plan here, and it's not just me. So I was walking out, and as I'm walking out, opening the door out of this hotel room, Barbara Walters is standing right there in front of me. And she goes, oh, Debbie, I'm so glad you came. And I'm like, ah, well, I was about to leave. I'm thinking to myself. So I'm like, yeah, ha, ha. So she takes me and guides me with her hand on my back into the room and stands here and now addresses the whole room. And I'm standing like this in front of all these people. And I'm like, what? Now that everyone's looking at me. Oh, my God. I just didn't want anyone to look at me. Why are they looking at me? And she's like, thank you all for coming. This, we're going to have a great day. We're going to just do some, some chemistry testing, and we're going to pluck a few people. And we'll sit everyone down, and we'll see how we all mesh and see how it all goes. And I'm still, like, frozen. Brr. Oh, my God. I'm, you're stressing me out just telling the story. OK, so she goes, OK, so the first group will be OK, Debbie. And then she goes around the room. She picks Joy Behar, Star Jones, Meredith Vieira. And she goes, OK, let's go sit, and let's go another room and do this. So that first group that you that sat down, and there were probably about 2,000 people who came through there, 2,500 people. There were 700 people for me, wow. for the young one. So of all those people who came through in those two or three days, the first group that sat down was the group you saw on TV. Wow, the chemistry was just there. I think it was just there. And I think, again, it was just, I had nothing to prove. Because I li literally had nothing to prove. <laughs> like, there was nothing there for me to, n nothing more than I go to NYU and I work at MTV. Like, I can't compete with you. And I'm not even going to pretend I can because God knows I don't know half the stuff that any of you know. And I'm not going to, like, try to start talking about stuff I don't know, right? So for me, again, I. It was just the experience, and now I got myself into this, and, oh, boy, I had to just finish it, right? Um, I think, you know, a lot of the people had perhaps, um, a lot of the people in there were really, like, i got to get this job. i got to get this job. This is a job of a lifetime. Working for Walters, you know, and really, really hard-hitting journalists. And maybe, you know, a lot of that came through because at the end of the day, that show, it ended up being scripted. A lot of it was scripted. Okay. A lot of that stuff that you saw on there, it's, you know, they kind of told you in the end what they wanted you to say, and that's because of advertisers and stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, we want you to be you, but mm, not so much. And I'll tell you why. Because Tide and Downey and Cheerios doesn't like that. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, remember, it's a business. So I think because we were so open and so raw, and, you know, Mary Vera is one of the most amazing women I've ever met in this business and has so much integrity, and she's very, who you see is, is who she is. And I think, you know, Star Jones, having been a lawyer, she was kind of feisty and wanted to, you know, kind of get in there. And they knew that was great. A producer would see that and say, that's good. And Joy was a comedian, so her job is to be off color and crazy and say whatever the hell she wants to say. And people are going to be okay with it because she was older. Like this, an older divorcee, single mom who used to be a teacher. So she'll say things that perhaps someone that was young, perhaps I couldn't say them, but she could say them and it's acceptable. And then Barbara's Barbara. And... It just worked, and all those people that they sat down after that just didn't have that same chemistry. So then I get a phone call a week later, and this is when we had answering machines. It was before, you know, you literally had a tape. And I'm coming home from MTV, and I remember thinking, I'm going to have to quit because I can't afford to work at MTV anymore. Like, it was, it was like I was going broke. $75 a day, Aside it was... Yes, yeah, so I was like, I've got to quit. I really have to get a real job. I can't work at MTV and go to NYU and blah, blah, blah. So I'd gone in to ask Dave. I said, I need, I don't know what to tell you. I need a raise. Like, I, this is tough. And he goes, okay, we're going to give you $100 a day. 
and I, they may as well said they're giving me $5,000 a day because in my brain that's how it felt. Like, yes, $100 a day. <laughs> I have made it, success. Um, so I get home and there is a notice on my door from Con Edison. Do you guys know Con Edison? It's the electric company. And it's saying, if you do not get down here by 5 o'clock tonight, we're turning your lights off. I'm like, ah, oh, shit, okay. So I get in the house, <laughs> I'm like, open the door, I go in, I'm listening to the answer machine. I'm like, this cannot. It's like, hello, Debbie, this is Barbara Walters. We couldn't do the, the show without you, you've got the job. And I go, no, I'm, no, this is not for real. I play it again. And I'm like, my friends are so mean. My friends are so, so, I mean, why would you do that to me? It's so cruel. I say nothing. I sit in complete silence, still kind of trying to digest everything that is coming in. Is this true? Is this not true? My, um, oh, look at that. That's my husband. Sorry, honey. So, <laughs> so, again. Yeah, because Barbara. Oh, baby. We couldn't do the show without you. So my roommate comes home, that roommate who was the one who you got the phone call, and she says to me, I said, you have to listen to this. Is this is someone in the newsroom making a joke? And she says to me, Debbie, that's Barbara Walters. Call her back. What is wrong with you? Call her back. I was panicked. So I pick up the phone, like, hi, it's Debbie. Oh, she goes, oh, baby. And she called me baby for years. Oh, baby, we couldn't do it without you, blah, 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 blah. So who should we send the paperwork to? Paperwork? I'm like, I don't have an agent. <laughs> I mean, what? She goes, okay, your, my agent will be your agent. <laughs> and that's how Jim Griffin, who oh, was wow. like one of the biggest ballers at William Morris, became my agent. I'm like, what? So that all happens. Uh, very quickly, we start kind of rehearsing for the show. I'm still going to NYU. And the one of the first shots you saw on The View was them filming my... Um, Graduation. Yeah, so I graduated, wow. yeah, when I was like just about to start the show. Wow, and the show was a smash hit from the, the it beginning. Was a smash, well, not from the beginning. It was tough. I'll tell you what, daytime TV is it's a tough game. And they may have wanted people to think it was a success from the get go because it's Barbara Walters, and you better believe we're going to have people think it's a success because she is the grand dame over here at ABC. But it was tough. We couldn't get a guest. We could not get a guest. We had like, the first person who came on was, um, what's his toes? Magnum P.I., Tom, Tom Selleck, yeah. And he was amazing because he was good friends with Barbara. So he was like, I'll do you solid, I'll come on the show. He was, could not have been better because you know that's a great way to launch. Then we had Lou Diamond Phillips come on. Barbara was pulling so many favors. Like the booking department was null and void because they were trying to book and they're like, we don't know what your show is. We're all kind of afraid. What is this talk format? Are you going to, you know, it was before that everything was a very sit down sort of interview and people weren't like as free as we were on that show or seemingly free. So the first six months were bumpy, really bumpy. And we had the network executives there every day breathing down our throats. And they were basically being like, we gave you all this money, Barbara. It better work. And how was it for you being on the air? Was the pressure building at that point? Or oh. were you still like, I don't have anything to Well, I think it began, when I started to realize just how, um, what a big deal it was. And I was no longer at MTV and just playing around and like nobody was looking at every move and noticing my hair or my clothes or, or my vernacular or whether I put my hands on my face or how I'm sitting, like you're, under the microscope in such a huge way that it can be debilitating. And you still have the pink hair? No. They finally had gotten the pink oh, hair okay, out, okay. but my hair ended up turning taupe in the meantime. It was like I had khaki hair because they couldn't get the color out. <laughs> it eventually went back to blonde. And you're 21 at this point? 22? Yeah. Wow. I'd, yeah. It was, it was stressful. The first day I walked off that set, I threw up. And wow. I'd never thought I, anyone could throw up from nerves. Trust me, it happens, and it, it was so scary, so, so scary, and I remember just going to my dressing room just crying and having hives. Wow. It was, because when that light turns on, you're like, wow, 
okay, the entire nation is now watching me because I'm sitting next to the most famous journalist in the world, the female journalist who basically lit the way for everyone. Yeah. So the curiosity alone, it got me in my head. Like I got in my own head, which, right. which interestingly enough, the reason I got the job and the reason I'd gotten so far to begin with is because I wasn't in my head. And the, so the minute I got in my head, and then you realize that's why you got the job, and then it starts the vicious cycle, right? And it was so, so, so scary. And then it was the, it was strange because again, remember there was an anonymity to me. I didn't care. I was going to raves, going to Beastie Boys concerts and Prodigy concerts, and then suddenly, I'm this girl on this new TV show, and I'd walk uh, down the street in New York City and be like, oh boy. A whole lot goes along with this that I was not prepared for. Oh, wow. So you got famous real quick. Real quick. And then page six in the paparazzi because there's nobody in New York. Like, who are they going to take pictures of? Who are they going to talk about? Everybody was in L.A. Yeah. So they had, like, one brand new person that they decided to <laughs> kind of glom onto. And I was not used to not being just a kid from NYU and from MTV. So I had to learn very quickly sort of how to be, oh, hello. And I was not very good at that <laughs> at all. That was not... And how big of a raver were you? Were you like glow sticks and pacifier? Oh my gosh. I had roller skates, okay? Oh boy. Oh wow. Nice. I loved it. Ints, 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 ints. That was my jam. Were you still able to pull off some raving? Did you have to put a, an wigs. outfit on? Or you, okay. Yeah, yeah I would still go out with my right? friends. Yeah. No, I'd go out with my friends on Saturday. We'd go to the sound factory and I would wear wigs with my friends. Amazing. It was so much fun. It was a good time. No. So, you know, listen, I. I sort of got thrown to the wolves very quickly, and I learned to sink or swim like that. You don't have a choice. The camera's on. The prompter's on. Learn how to read it. And if you're not going to learn how to read it, you got to get out of here, kid, because you're sitting next to Barbara Walters. So, I mean, it was really tough, and I learned some, some lessons very quickly and in front of an entire nation who was there to kind of tear you down because they were like, who is this kid, and why does she deserve this job? I don't know. Why did I deserve the job? All I did was work hard, but it, anybody else could have deserved it as much as me. You know, there's nothing made me special except for being in that position at that time and for having great chemistry with them, mm. you know? And then you got spoofed by Saturday Night Live? Oh my God, incessantly. Now, <laughs> I really liked the spoofs. They made fun of us so bad that they, <laughs> They would call me, but say, I've always wanted to do a show with five different women from different generations and different backgrounds. This is how it started on SNL, and it was Sherry Terry. And they went through the whole group of all the women, and then they got to me, and they're like, and a complete idiot. And they would show like me like, because I mean, honestly, I look back at myself, and I said, what was I doing there? Like, they were so, they had so many, like, laurels to stand on. I had zero. I had nothing. I was just a college kid from, from, you know, Virginia, like what is happening here? But so they would, <laughs> they would put me in like a bag with a rabid squirrel, some of the skits on the show. And it was so funny, They're like, have we killed her yet? Still, she's still alive, what a shame. <laughs> so they, like Cameron Diaz played me and, and um, I think Scarlett Johansson and like really big people at the time. So for me, again, remember, I'm like, I can't even believe I'm sitting here. So for you to even be spoofing me, I'm still like, this is, Nuts. Even what is this yeah. happening? I, I don't even know why I'm here. This is all crazy. Barbara, on the other hand, not a fan. She was zero impressed. Like, she's like, I have worked my entire life. I have busted my butt to be here. I'm a respected journalist. I've interviewed the heads of every state and every president. I've interviewed Fidel Castro and like, a, and you're gonna make fun of me and do this whole thing? And we watched it together the first time because we knew they were going to do it. So we all sat and we watched it. We were on the road for something, I remember. And we're in the hotel room. And she was really mad. And she left. And then afterwards, we're like, should we just go to her room and kind of. So we go over there. And I'm like, OK, I get it. I understand. And I know you probably think I'm the dopey one. And why am I even addressing you? But my generation thinks this is so cool. Like, that's our, in a way, kind of where we would get our news source because it would like whatever the news was for the week they would go on and they would spoof it spoof it and they would become like political satire and so i was like so for them to notice that this is something and they don't know what it is but it's it's good enough to write a skit about this is good news 
This is really, really good news. It has somehow resonated with pop culture, and you should be thrilled. Now, I just, they've made fun of me my whole life with my, you know, my speech and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, this is great. This is making you cool. <laughs> like, what? So then she really started to get it. Like, I think her, her view on the thing sort of flipped. And we had Sherry O'Terry and Tracy Morgan and um, uh, Anna Gastar and all of them come on the show and play us. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and then you got to go on SNL And then yourself. I went on SNL. So when finally, you know, this all sort of spontaneously combusted, which was only a matter of time, I mean, I would say I was like, the view is like Survivor, and I was the first one voted off the island. And there were many more after me, but I was the first one to go. You know, little did I know what would happen after. Like, it's a tough spot to be in that spot. It's really tough, because aside from America telling you what they think and what they don't think, you know, you're putting yourself out there to be exposed, whatever that exposure is, and you need to know that people are going to attack you. Okay, so that's one facet of it. The other facet is you're trying to keep up with these people who are uber smart, you know what I mean, and who are so quick on their feet, and they've been doing television for 20 years. So that stress this stress coming from the public, this stress coming from over here because you're putting it on yourself, and then on top of it trying to, in a sense, make Barbara Walters proud because the last thing I wanted to do was, I mean, I was her choice. She handpicked me, and the last thing I wanted to do was make her wrong yeah. because she had these executives looking at her like, what the hell did you just do? This girl's 21 years old, and we're never putting another 21-year-old on daytime TV. This is insane. You know what I mean? But... But she stuck by me, and then in the end, the contract was up, and it'd come to an end, and so there I was, like, going, oh, my gosh, the biggest opportunity in my life, and I blew it. I blew it. Like, that's how I felt. Mm. And, you know, in retrospect, I didn't blow it. I did what they hired me to do. I was a 21-year-old kid, and there was different generations, different backgrounds, different views. And daytime TV, I don't think, was really prepared to have somebody that young on television because... In order to be on a show like that, you have to have experience. I had 21 years of experience, and most of it was in school or at a club. What the hell am I going to talk about? <laughs> but then sort of flipping it on its head, you know, years later, like, you know, I'm still very close with all the women, including Barbara and, and Bill Getty, who's still a great friend of mine, and we're going to work on something come up here soon. But... Like, we've all talked about it many times. Like, many times. Like, how could we have handled that better? Because then it became a huge, like, oh, my God, the young one's gone from The View. And then they were attacking the show. They were attacking me. They were attacking Barbara. It became, suddenly all these people were the press. When the press was attacking me because I was on the show, they suddenly came to my aid. And it's interesting how, you know, they'll glom onto something and be like, oh, you guys did her dirty. She was a kid. But when I was there, you all attacked me. So which one is it, you know? So whichever gets clicks. Whichever gets clicks. Whatever, yeah. So they, um, we sort of came to the conclusion that had instead of them poo-pooing me doing what I was doing as a 22-year-old, 21 or 22-year-old, instead of being like, oh my gosh, we can't believe she's doing this and oh, it's in the press, had they actually faced it and said. All right, Debbie, well, you're on page six today. Looks like you were out last night at the club. What happened? Because that's what the show was. Oh, okay. And the idea that, you know, somebody's mom was watching and they could relate because it's their daughter or their cousin or their niece or their granddaughter, like, people would have seen that sort of play out and would have seen us grow because I was a kid. I wasn't supposed to be Barbara Walters. But the pressure I'd placed on myself was I, I believed I was supposed to be. So then I ended up losing myself in the mess of it all. And then, you know, the rest is history. Wow. Why don't we talk about then what happened next and lead up to Home and Family, because I know everyone wants to hear about Home and Family show. Well, let's see. What happened next? Okay, I moved to L.A. and I started working on a show called... Um, Gosh, it was Screen TV, and then it turned into TV Guide Channel, and I launched that. And then from there, I went over to Fox, and I started working at Fox, and I did a show called Good Day 
um, Live, which was like the second part to Good Day LA. So Good Day LA was the local show, and then Good Day Live was the national show. It was me and Arthur Neville and Steve Edwards, and we did that for about two years, and then that got canceled. And then from there, I went to work at E. Oh, that's right. And then I was at E for about eight years. Oh my gosh, maybe 10 years, eight to 10 years. And I did all their, I brought back Fashion Police after Joan and Melissa had, oh, nice. and I brought that back. I relaunched that and I did all the red carpets with Ryan Juliana and all the, all the stuff there. And then we did a show called The Daily 10 and that was a big success. Did you ever get starstruck along the way in any of those red carpet interviews or anywhere else? You know, there are a few people that kind of stopped me in my tracks. Freddie Prince Jr. maybe? Did I get starstruck with him? <laughs> I don't know. Pulled the name of a random teenage heartthrob from the, the 90s oh, I mean, out of I mean, our ass. Like, <laughs> a few times with like George Clooney, and then after like the second or third time interviewing him, you realize, oh my gosh, he's just so cool, so it doesn't matter. It's like hanging out with your friend. Um, oh, I got starstruck with Robert De Niro. I mean, who's not going to get starstruck with him? And that's not a good person to get starstruck with because he's not a man of many words. <laughs> So if he's not going to talk and you're not going to talk, you're kind of like this. Oh boy. That was not good. But he was very sweet. And he's like, do you have another question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ah, yeah, I do. If I could just speak and have some water. Was there someone that you really wanted to interview for a long time and then you finally got that opportunity? Um, yeah, Robert Nero was one of them. I was oh, so impressed with him. And then I did. Um, Madonna. When I met Madonna, it was that was a full circle moment for me because I went back to seeing her at that moment on MTV and thinking, gosh, and thinking, wow, I don't had I not seen that, I'm not sure I would have been so influenced to then want to go work at MTV. Like you kind of changed the trajectory of my life and you don't know it. I'm sure she has for so many other people. And again, like a complete dope. I couldn't say much. It was like, I like your dress. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, okay. So it was, she was doing bedtime stories at that time. It was, a, it was a, like a book and a, a, an album. So, um, yeah, those are the two that I really kind of froze up with. Yeah. And so then I end up at, at, at MTV for, I mean, not MTV, at E for a long time. And then I, um, then I kind of stepped away from Hollywood because my father got really sick. And he... We didn't know what was going on with him. And eventually, you know, we're getting, like, taken to all these doctors and all these different places. And turned out that he was diagnosed with ALS. So I made the decision to leave. And I was like, I don't, I don't really care. I don't want to do this anymore. So I went back to Virginia and I took care of him for three years. And I mean, thank goodness I had such, my career had been as I'd been as busy and had been constantly working because I had the money to be able to say I can do this and I can help pay for him and I can you know make sure that he's not going to live like in a home and I can make sure the doctors come to us and so you know my sister and my brother had families already of their own and they were my brother you know works for a pharmaceutical company my sister works she's in the legal department of a bank so it's it was a little more difficult for them to say I can put my my life on hold and for me it was easy. I could say, okay, fine. If you don't want to hire me, if I if I step away from Hollywood and then I come back and people don't want to hire me, I don't want to work for somebody who doesn't want to hire me because I went to go take care of my family. That's not the environment I want to be in anyway. So, you know, so be it. And, and I had a good run and that's fine by me. So I went home and took care of him and unfortunately he lost his fight with ALS. And it's, if anyone knows about ALS, it's an ugly, ugly disease. It's like, you're basically a prisoner in your own body. Like, you don't move, and but your brain is 100% intact. He couldn't talk at the end, and he had the computer, and he could, he would, um, we could do the New York Times crossword puzzle together just by him moving his eyes to talk with the computer, but he couldn't move. I mean, it's, you know, it's like you're fully aware of what's happening, where, you know, I always say Alzheimer's and dementia are equally as hateful, you know, one, the person doesn't understand what's happening. The other one, the person's fully aware of what's happening and is just miserable. So after that and after I <laughs> basically spent almost all of my money 
for his health care and trying to, you know, do whatever I could. And to be honest with you, I would have spent it all and I would do it for another 10 years if I could have kept him alive. Yeah. What are some of the biggest things you learned from him? From my dad? Oh, my God. He, um, he, one day when I was taking him to, I'd have to lift him and get him in the car. I was taking him to physical therapy and it's kind of like you just go through it. Like the doctors look at you and they go, look, this is the time you have. We'll do the physical therapy. Is it going to help? Chances are no, because it's not helped anybody else. But, you know, keep doing it, whatever. Keep your muscles agile. So uh, he taught me so many lessons to be kind, to put yourself in other people's shoes, to, you know, to never expect anything from anyone, to always earn everything, to work as hard as you possibly can, because no one's going to hand you anything. You're going to have to go get it, and you have to earn it. So. Probably the most profound thing he ever said to me was when it was towards the end and I was driving home and he was in the car and driving him back from, from his physical therapy and on the radio there's a commercial for Tahiti, come to Tahiti and this and that and blah, blah. Now, I would never, ever let my father see me be sad about his condition. In his eyes, like I was like, no, no, you're going to live. I don't care what these doctors say. They're wrong. And this is how we're going to do it. And he was always very, very happy and very, very just because I'm, I'm all about the mind-body connection. If you start to tell somebody that their days are numbered and they start to believe it, their days are numbered. It's over. But if you can keep them as happy and as light as possible in the time that they do have here, then you're doing them a great service. So that was like I would walk out of the room and bawl hysterically, but never in front of him. So he said, um, and, he, and I said, oh, my gosh, I'd love to go there someday. And now, again, if you know anything about ALS, they can hardly speak. And it takes a long time to, you know, Stephen Hawkins, obviously, is the most famous person that had ALS. And, and towards the end, he didn't speak at all. And you saw he had the, the machine. But my dad was still talking at this point And, like, but it would take him five minutes to get that sentence out. So he struggled, and he got the words out, and he said to me, when I said, I want to go there someday, he said, not someday, today. And I'm driving, I'm like, what? Did you just say not someday, today? I said, Dad, what do you mean today? He said, not someday, today. Tomorrow is not a promise. Look at me. He said, look at me. And he went from being the most healthy, most vivacious, like everybody wanted to be around my dad. He was that guy. Kids, men, women, children, animals. He just had this weird Pied Piper thing. And he was always like, he'd walk in. They're like, oh, there's Nico. He was always smiling. He was the life of the party. And he. Well, it, you got your charm and <sighs> sense of humor? I don't know. Maybe, you know, I, I certainly hope so. I, I would love to have those qualities that he had. But like, it made me realize nothing is promised. Like tomorrow, like any one of us could leave right now. That's it. It's over. So. You know, do, do the best you can and do as much as you can with the time you're given because we don't know what that time is. We have no clue. And just be kind, man. Life is hard enough for everybody. Just be kind. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I didn't realize this was going to take this turn. I apologize. <laughs> Thanks for sharing this with all. It's, yeah. it's great to hear you know, that you get to have that time with him and we're still gaining yeah. those, those lessons and perspectives. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something really beautiful in, um, in experiencing somebody in their last, like, their last days of life. There's something really beautiful in that. And, and I feel like I was given such a gift. Like, thank God I had the opportunity to do that. Like, thank God I was able to see that and see the beauty. And because you see the beauty in life, in, unfortunately, death. And I know that sounds wild, but it, it just, if you've ever experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. And you're like, wow, this is so heavy, but it's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's so fleeting. So none of this matters. Like, who cares if I worked for Barbara Walters? Who cares if I did the, who cares? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's all like, like dust in the wind. That's it. It's over. So I think really at the end of the day, if you're just nice to people and you, you know, your legacy should be, not I was on TV or I did this show or that show. So what? Your legacy should be I was a really good human and I was kind to people and I helped people however I could and however I saw fit. Yeah.
and I just tried to be better every single day. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because what's kind of brought me to the show, to Home and Family now, is like I have that opportunity to really share that with the world. And you know, maybe it's not as big a platform as The View was, but you know, The View was, it was everybody wanted to fight. Mm. And I'm not a fighter, I just, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to be nice and keep the peace. And on Home and Family, we really are able to really share goodness with everybody. And I feel like right now in our day and age, we need goodness. We need some goodness in the world. We need yeah. people to be kind to one another. Like what's happening? How did everything get flipped on its head? And, and people are good. People are good. They're innately good. I don't believe that people are not good. And I think that they want to feel good. And they're bombarded with so much yuckiness right now. And, and home and family sort of is a place that's it's a safe haven. You can turn it on. And you know we're not going to talk about any of it. We're only going to be there to be kind, to give you some information, whether it's some health information or some beauty information, you know, cook a couple things and make some crafts and, <laughs> you know what I mean? Be like, love one another, everybody. Get some dogs adopted. It's just, it's a really, it's interesting that my sort of path has brought me here. It's the perfect place for me right now. Yeah, and it's valuable to the audience. You know, you're yeah. bringing on people who have amazing stories and getting their messages out into the world. Yeah. Not to mention it's hilarious. Right, and we're spreading some goodness. Yeah. Like, my job is to make you smile. You have a million reasons not to smile in the day, but you also have a million reasons to smile. It's up to you. Like, every day you wake up, you have a choice. You know, make excuses or make progress. It is up to you. It's very simple. And hopefully what we do helps people make progress in the right direction. You know, I'm not saying, you know, be Pollyanna and be delusional. Life is hard. It's hard for everybody. But, you know... It's not that hard to smile. Amen to that. You know? Yeah. Awesome. So let's talk about your next chapter coming up, man. Well, we're doing this awesome skincare line with you guys. Yeah. Ikari. I'm very excited about that. Which is bringing me back to my Greek roots again, which is, you know, something I'm very proud of. I did that cookbook. It's all Greek to me as a sort of love letter to my dad. I, I, I give a lot of the proceeds of the book to the ALS Foundation. Hopefully they'll come up with some something, at least some medicine that'll slow the progression. But um, so this is sort of a continuation of that. You know, when everyone said, why do you want to do this? And I was like, because it's, again, like a love letter to my, to my people and my dad. And, and the idea of like, there's, you know, I think eight blue zones in the world. I'm not exactly right. But the blue zones are where people live to like outlive everyone else on the planet and they're healthier and they don't have disease and scientists can't quite figure out why this is happening. And they, um, they one of those places is Ikaria, which is an island in Greece. And they've dubbed this island the, peop the place where people forget to die because they live to be like 120 years old. And I'm not talking 120 hunched over. I'm talking like physically fit people. And it goes back to what they're putting in their bodies, you know, it's, Hippocrates, food is thy medicine, medicine is thy food. You know, that goes back thousands of years. So again, this is nothing about this is new. It's just people need to be reminded because we've come so far. Yeah. So if you get back to the natural stuff, whether it's, you know, all the Greek women, they all, and, and they all have their, oh, use this and use that and blah, blah. And you look at their skin and none of them are running the plastic surgeon and they all look really good. Yeah, and you're super impressed. Like, what is going on here? You know, oh, use the sea salt water with some olive oil for this or that. And it works, you guys. I mean, I remember my mom used to say, put Greek yogurt on your face when you get a sunburn. I said, she's out of her mind. Guess what? Now they're all doing it. They're like, oh, yeah, Greek yogurt takes the sting <laughs> out. I'm like, my mom's been saying this for years. So the idea was to bring a piece of the Mediterranean to the rest of the world and to show them that you don't use, have to have harmful chemicals that are endocrine disruptors all over your body that are only going to cause more disease and more damage in the long run. You can use things that are on this planet that you know, have been put in this universe for that reason. You just have to use them correctly, and, and they work. It's not going to be an overnight thing, but it's going to be a lot better for you in the long run. And I'm really, and I know these things work. And I went to Greece over the summer and I did a lot of research on it. And I was like, what are you guys using and trying to figure out what they're doing? And they're using a lot of pomegranate and they're using um, olive oil and basil and, and oregano and um, obviously lemon and um, 
some things like some interesting things out of the Mediterranean Sea. And and I came to you guys and you were all about it. And I love it. And I, I love what your team does here because you guys are really incredible. I mean, to talk about some of the, the stuff that we're putting together that truly has amazing benefits. Like you can use, there's um, natural forms of retinol. You don't yeah. have to use the chemical. And these are yeah. day retinol, so you, you can go out in the sun. And they're things that plump your, your skin that are, again, not fillers that, that have amazing results. So I'm excited to show people that you can do these things and, and look beautiful. It's almost like the, the, um, the, we found the fountain of youth in Greece, at least in Icaria. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, man. It's it's been so exciting to get to know yeah. you and be doing this together. Know, the products are going to make such you. a great impact. I'm so proud of this. Thank you so much for doing this. Really excited about it. I'm very passionate about it, in case you didn't notice. So hopefully the rest of the world will be as passionate as I am. Well, thank you so much for being here and opening up with us. I loved hearing your story, and we're so excited to be partnering with you to continue your amazing mission. So. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share my story and for helping me continue to spread all the Greekness across the world. Yeah, <laughs> I love you, Craig. Great. All right. I love you. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to hear a story that's even wilder than that one, click here. You only have five seconds, though. Five, four, three, two, one, go.